Romans at chapter 8, commencing in verse 18 through verse number 25. Paul's letter to the church at Rome, chapter number 8, commencing in verse 18. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience with endurance wait for it thank you you may be seated <laughs> the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever I want to talk a moment from this subject already and not yet Already and not yet. We are in the kingdom of God already and not yet. Romans chapter 8 deals specifically and particularly with our life in the spirit. And there is a dual nature in us. We have the spirit of Christ, but we still struggle with our fleshly nature. We are already children of God and not yet. Because there is a duality in our person. We are spiritual on one hand and carnal on the other hand. We are victorious on one hand and utterly defeated on the other hand. There's a war going on. My flesh wars against my spirit. I have a new nature in that I am born of the spirit of God. And at the same time, I am carnal in my desires. I want to do the right thing. But evil is always present. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing. And the evil that I thought I had given up, the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. 
because I am in the kingdom and not yet. Paul in Romans chapter 8 does a masterful job of laying out for us uh, in a very strong theological perspective what belongs to us as children of God. We have an adoption. Then we have an assurance. Then we have an affluence that belongs to us as children of God. But even though we have life in the spirit, there is still the war with our flesh. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Paul says, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. He says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead dwell in you, then he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. For as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children then we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be that we suffer with him that we may be also glorified together. That's, that's high church. That's strong spiritual talk. But then we got to get our feet back on the ground and recognize that although I walk in the spirit, I still struggle in my flesh. Um, this, this duality of our person, this, this already and not yet, strains the serious Christian because we really want to please God. I said the serious Christian really seriously honestly wants to please God but we have a sworn enemy Satan himself who battles with us on a daily basis to keep us from pleasing the God we say we love I've come to love this hymn come thou fount of every blessing because that hymn says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord. Take and seal it. Seal it for thy throne above. I really mean that when I sing it. But as soon as church is over, as soon as I get up from my knees in my devotional time, the spirit that I just claimed I love, I do something to displease because there is a war in my members. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm not trying to discourage the Christian walk. I'm trying to tell you when you're a serious Christian, it's a stress, it's a strain. 
It's a struggle always because when you want to do right, Satan will not let you do right. Because your old nature will always come up and sometimes the spirit gets the victory. And then sadly there are times when the flesh gets the victory. Uh, that's why I think you ought to come to church every chance you get. That's why I think you ought to read the Bible every chance you get. You ought to be in the company of godly people. You ought to ask God constantly to fill you with his Holy Spirit because every, on every hand, on every turn, the devil is trying to snatch you from the Father's hand. This word, this word of already and not yet is tension for me because I know I'm a child of God. I know I've been born again. I know my name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I know I've been called to preach. I, I know that. These are things I'm not guessing about. I know that, but I still struggle daily to please God. Now, now, if some of you have figured that out, uh, God bless you. Thank you. I wish you would give me your secret. But there are those of us in here who know we've been saved, know we've been changed, know our names have been written in heaven, but every day it's a strain, it's a stress, it's a struggle. I mean to do right when I get up in the morning. But before nightfall, the real Terry Anderson shows up. Uh, I wish I had my 7.30 crowd. The honest people come to church at 7.30 who recognize that you ain't got it all together yet. You're a Christian, but you're still struggling. You've been born again, but you still got some issues. You know God, but every time you desire to do good, evil is always present. Yeah. Let's, 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 let's look at what the text says. For I reckon. That word reckon is an accounting term. Uh, I reckon. That's a mathematical term. That's, a, that's an accounting term. I reckon. Paul says, when I, when I put it all on the scale, uh, when, when I balance it all out, when I look at it on one hand and look at it on the other hand, I reckon uh, that, that, that one side outweighs the other side. We are suffering in this world. That's on one side. But, but on the other side, the scales will be balanced when he comes again. I'm struggling right now, but God's going to straighten it out. I'm going through it right now, but God's going to level it all out. I'm having a hard time right now, but this too shall pay. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which will ultimately, finally, be revealed. I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But let me say two or three things here and I'm going to leave you alone. Already and not yet. Paul talks about while we are in this world, in this flesh, in this body, 
we are constantly groaning. First of all, creation is groaning. Mm. Earthquakes in Chile and in California and in some places here in Texas is creation groaning. A mudslide in Washington State Polar caps melting. Unusual weather patterns that researchers are calling global warming effects. Groaning. Uh, we had an unusually bitter winter. The summers seem to me to be getting hotter. Floods carrying away whole town. The earth shaking under our feet. That's creation groaning. Call it global warming. Call it unusual atmospheric conditions. Call it tectonic plates shifting underneath the earth's crust. Whatever you want to call it, it's creation wanting to get back to what God created it to be. That was not happening before Adam and Eve sinned. I wish I had a Bible reader. Because the Bible says before Adam and Eve sinned, it never even rained. God watered the earth with a mist. Vegetation was lush and growing. They had never heard thunder before. The earth had never shook before. Rivers had never overflowed their banks before. All of this is a consequence of sin. I wish I had a witness here. When Adam sinned, he plunged creation into suffering. The world, the earth, the atmosphere, everything is out of kilter because of sin. Creation is groaning. Trees are budding before their season. Fruit falling before time. Because the creation doesn't know what's going on. It's groaning. It's, it's suffering underneath the burden of sin. Brothers and sisters, not only does creation groan with earthquakes and floods and, and mudslides and, and atmospheric kinds of conditions that have never happened before. The creation groans, but also the Christian groans. You, you don't have to be old to testify right here that you're not the person you were 15 years ago. Some of y'all getting kind of quiet now because you, you have died it. I said you've died it. D-Y-E-D. -E you've died it. You've Tucked it in. You cut it back. You straightened it out. You're trying to make it look younger and fresher. But the truth is, you're groaning. Let me see if I can help somebody here. You, you can't run as fast as you used to run. Your mind is not as quick and nimble as it used to be. You can't see without your glasses now. 
Never got a witness here? You go in the room to look for something and got to back up to try to remember what you just went in there for. You're looking for your car keys and they're in your hand. You're looking for your eyeglasses and you got them on. You wake up in the morning and got to sit down a while before you can figure out where you are. Have I got a witness here? If it's not your shoulder, it's your knee. If it's not your knee, it's your back. If it's not your back, it's your elbow. There's a leak. I wish I had a witness in this old building. And one day my soul has got to move. It's always something cracking and leaking and leaning because even as a Christian, I'm groaning. Let me, let me talk to some real Christian in here this morning. You ever been so sick you couldn't pick your head up off the pillow? You ever been so burdened down and couldn't figure out really what you could put your finger on that was going on with you? I wish I had somebody to help me. You were in a room full of people, but you were still lonely. House full of company, but you just couldn't get yourself together. Because there are some things that the Christian needs that human companionship can't feel. Sometimes I get lonesome for heaven and, and I want to be with the one who created me. I got brothers and sisters. I got friends and family. But this is not my home. I'm a pilgrim. I'm a stranger traveling through this barren land. And thank God, I don't want to get comfortable in this world. Now, now let me see if I can unpack that for you. This world is in a mess. I mean, you can't hardly look at a commercial without some sexual or homosexual overtones in the commercial. You can't hardly watch television with your children. Talk back to me if you can. Modern family is a disgrace. What's going on in the sports world? What's going on on the streets? What's going on on the news? Every time you read the newspaper, it's a rape. It's a child being molested. It's some woman being murdered. It's some crime being committed. If you can get comfortable with that, you are not a child of God. Because the child of God is not comfortable in a world where there's rape and incest and murder and crime and killing and stealing. This world is not my home. Um, as believers, we make the mistake when we cling too tenaciously to that, will, that, to that which will not last. This stuff that you got, this house that you brag on, this car that you can't get through shining, these shoes that you got stacked from the floor up to the ceiling, these clothes that we wear, this money that we accumulate is temporary. I said it's temporary. I was talking about it with the pastor last week. There's nothing glamorous about getting old. We, we have romanticized it and glamorized it to make it look something, to be something appealing, something to look for. But I'm not looking forward to medicine every day. I'm not looking forward to pain when I wake up every morning. Right now, it's just every other morning. But I understand once you cross a certain threshold, if it ain't one thing, it's another. And then if you're not having any physical trauma, it's your children that's about to kill you. It's members of your family who's on your heart and you're always praying for them and you're always hoping the best for them, but they don't seem to be listening to anything you have to say. If you're comfortable with that, you're not a child of God. 
We are pilgrims here, strangers here, traveling through this barren land. The late Dr. C.B.T. Smith, who preached a few years ago before he went to be with the Lord, he preached at the Church Without Walls. Uh, and uh, in that message, he was making comment of the Pastor West that sent a car to get him at the hotel. And he said, waiting for his car, he came out of the elevator, came from downstairs, and he saw a young man with a tray with some breakfast on it, with some roses and a newspaper under his arm. And Dr. Smith said he got out of the elevator and said, buddy, where are you going? He said, my wife and I are on our honeymoon, and I'm going to surprise her uh, with a breakfast uh, in bed. And I got some roses here, and I got my newspaper under my arm. And, and Dr. Smith said, he said, have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Go upstairs. Meet your wife. Surprise her uh, with her breakfast and flowers and read your newspaper. And he said, I got in the car and went to the church without walls and I thought about it. One day, he won't be carrying a tray with breakfast and flour. He's going to be carrying a tray with medicine to a woman who don't even know his name. Because life will shift on you. Somebody ought to help me preach it. One day that woman who is beautiful and young and fine will perhaps end up with dementia and not even know his name. Enjoy yourself, young people. Have a good time. Run as fast as you can. Learn everything you can. Be young as long as you can. But somebody here who's crossed that threshold, and I don't know where that threshold is, because for every one of us, it's a different number, but all of us will cross that threshold when life will start to turn on us. And as Christians, we will start to groan. One day there's an MRI on your knee. And it ain't nothing but arthritis. And somebody will tell you to take this, and somebody will tell you to take that. And you will take this and take that. But the truth is, you're groaning under the weight of sin. You're already a child of God. But because of the strain that comes our way, we are not in the kingdom yet. But here's the good news. Everything prior to this has been bad news. The creation has been groaning. The Christian has been groaning. But read this right here in the text. Paul says the comforter comes alongside us and groans with us. I wish I had one or two more believers here. In my stress, in my strain as a believer, I have a helper. I have a comforter who comes alongside me to help carry my load. And then when my load gets too heavy, he takes it upon himself so that I don't even have to bear it at all. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. I said, thank God for the Holy Ghost. He doesn't come to make us tongue talkers and holy dancers. He comes to make us enjoy the Christian life. He comes to shoulder our burden to get under our load because as long as you live in this flesh, you will constantly groan. But you're going to help me close this, won't you? Paul does not leave us in the dark concerning how God will take care of us. He says, likewise, read the rest of it when you get home, the spirit who understands our infirmity. He groans with us. He's with us in our struggles. He's in, with us in our pain. And then Paul goes on to close that great chapter by saying, for we know. I wish I had two or three Bible readings. For we know in spite of our groaning, in spite of the misery that's in this world, in spite of the trouble that's going on in our families, in spite of the doctor's visits and the pain that's in our body. Because if you live long enough, you're going to start losing your loved ones. 
and you're going to be in the world perhaps by yourself. All your brothers and sisters are gone. Your mother and father are gone. And if you look at that long enough, it could discourage you. But Paul says, we know. I wish I had somebody to help me here. In spite of the fact that you get fired on your job, in spite of the fact that your friends turn against you, for we know. In spite of the fact that there are some no good people who come to church and tell you one thing in your face and something else behind your back. For we know. In spite of the fact that you get lonesome for heaven and home and it looks like things are not going to work out in your favor. If you are a child of God, for we know. I wish I had one or two more Bible readers here. Sometimes it gets difficult being a Christian. Sometimes the burden is almost more than we can handle. Sometimes the strain shows on our faces. But we know. Sometimes the hurt is almost insuperable. Sometimes the burden is almost incalculable. But we know. I wish I had two or three witnesses here. We get hurt sometimes. We get lied on sometimes. We get abused sometimes. We get misused sometimes. But we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and to those who are the called according to his purpose for whom the Lord calls I wish I had a witness here he predestines and who the Lord predestines he has already called them and after he calls them he sanctifies them that means God sets them apart for himself that no matter what comes my way God's got my back no matter what my enemy tries to do to me, I will be victorious. No matter what the devil throws at me, God will give me the victory. No matter how dark the night, no matter how long the day, no matter how many tears I shed, weeping may endure for a night. But if I just hold on, joy will come in the morning this present suffering is not to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us because at the end of that passage in chapter 8 or chapter 8 verse 25 Paul says if we wait for it if we wait for it I said if we wait for it we already got it but we still got to wait for it let me see if I can make that make sense. You think I'm shouting right now, but you ought to wait a while. You think I'm praising God right now. You just wait a minute. You think I'm lifting my hands right now. Wait until I'm fully adopted. Wait until I fully get my reward. Is there anybody here waiting on the earnest expectation? What that word earnest means is that the Holy Ghost came and made an earnest payment. You know what an earnest payment is. When you're getting ready to buy a house, you don't have all the money, but you want the realtor to know that you're serious about the purchase. So you come up with some earnest money to let them know it's not mine yet but I'm already paying down on it. I wish I had a witness here. This joy that I have is already mine, but I'm still paying down on it. And you ought to be there when he calls my name. Is there anybody here getting ready to shout right now? You think I'm praising God right now? Wait till my breakthrough comes. You think I'm raising my hands right now. Wait till my answer comes. 
You think I'm giving God glory right now? Wait till my full adoption comes. Is there anybody here waiting on Jesus? They that wait, come on, grab somebody's hand and tell them they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Tell somebody they shall mount up. I wish I had a witness. With wings like eagle. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely? I long for heaven and home. When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye, I said his eye, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. Why don't you grab somebody? Why don't you shake somebody's hand? Tell him I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye, his eye, I know he's all right. right now but just as soon as my feet strike Zion I'm gonna lay down my heavy burden I'm gonna tell him thank you for all you've done for me thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you A pilgrim. I'm, I'm just a stranger. This world is not my home. I'm, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. We know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle is dissolved. We have another building. A house not made with hand, but eternal in heaven. Some glad morning when this life is over. And brothers and sisters, one day it's going to be over. But when this life is over, I will fly away. No more sickness. No more separation in our families. No more death. No more funerals. No more hearses. No more graves. For the former things are passed away. Paul said we see through a glass darkly. But then face to face I will know even as also I am known. And then John says, Beloved, behold what manner of love have the Father bestowed upon us that we are now 
the sons of God. But it does not appear what we shall be. But hallelujah, we know that when he comes, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I'm on my way to the promised land. I'm on my way to the city built four square. This world is not my home. The whole while I'm here, I'm groaning. I miss my mother and father. I miss my loved ones who've gone. But one day I'm going to see them again. But before I see them, I want to see Jesus and tell him thank you for saving me. Thank you for going to the cross and dying in my place. Thank you for getting up one Sunday morning. And because you got up, I'm the first fruits of your resurrection. I'm going to get up as well because this world is temporary. It's fleeting and passing away. The creature, the creation, and the comforter groans. But then when the full adoption takes place, God shall wipe all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death no more sea for the former things shall be passed away then we shall see him as he is face to face we shall see him we shall behold him while we are in this flesh we are groaning but one day we will see the one who died for us and thank him for our salvation and we will see him because Dr. Caesar Clark said there's a rainbow wrapped around his shoulder to absorb some of the light of his presence so that the saints might get a chance to behold his face. Just to behold him, just to look at him, just to see him. When I see Jesus, I want to thank him for all he's done for me. I'm in the kingdom already, but not yet. I'm shouting already, but not yet. Because there's an innumerable caravan on their way to that city. And John said, I saw them coming from the north and the south and the east and the west. And I asked the elder, who are they? He said, these are they who've come through great tribulation. And they've washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb.